Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, this is the first session of the course. Oops, just a second. I'm sorry for this. Uh, that was our live broadcast. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is the first session of the course Tools for Post-Conflict Urban Recovery in Ukraine, organized by TU Delft in collaboration with UNUM, the Ukraine, the Netherlands Urban Network, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia, Zaud University in the Netherlands and a host of our Ukrainian partners. My name is Roberto Rocco and uh, together with my colleague uh, Caroline Newton, we are the organizers of this course. Uh, I'm an associate professor of spatial planning and strategy at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. My research focus is the governance of sustainability transitions and, and particularly the notion of spatial justice applied as a framework for policy making and planning. Uh, together with my colleague, Caroline Newton, as I mentioned, we are the facilitators of the course. Uh, this course will seek to discuss spatial strategies for an integrated urban recovery in post-conflict settings, investigating the process of reconstruction and what the notion of building back better implies tackling inequalities, strengthening the capacities of local actors, pursuing a green, resilient, and inclusive urban recovery anchored on sound spatial planning, design, and policy. The course focuses on practical tools of spatial planning and strategy making, land policy, building, and planning standards for climate adaptation and circularity, policies and programs for ensuring the development of adequate, adequate rehousing, as well as mechanisms to ensure fa fairness, participation, and transparency throughout the urban recovery process and reconstruction phase. In the development of this course, we wanted to use the term post-conflict as an open term that allows us to converse with colleagues, not only from Ukraine, but also from other areas affected by conflict and violent shocks. However, it's important to acknowledge that language has been used as a tool for disinformation and the erosion of public debate. And we want to fully acknowledge that what is going on in Ukraine at the moment is a full senseless and tragic war perpetrated by a madman on a fully sovereign state. While the war is not over yet, we want to salute our friends and colleagues from Ukraine who bravely bear the brunt of this war and whom we wish to wholeheartedly support. All instructors in this course are working voluntarily as a service to the reconstruction of Ukraine and in support of our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. Today with us, to, uh, today with us uh, apart from our speakers, Professor Julie Lawson and Kalina Sukomut, is Paolo Goroshovsky, architect and advisors to the Dutch Board of Government Advisors and an union core member. Before I introduce our speakers, I give Pablo the word. Pablo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining. This is a really special moment for us. Uh, we've been working very hard over the last couple of months on this occasion. And uh, today, as I know, we have uh, more than 500 people who have enrolled in this course. So thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Paolo Varhovsky. Uh, I'm an architect from Ukraine. Uh, as Roberta said, I work as an advisor to the Dutch Board of Governmental Advisors, CRA, uh, which deals with urgent topics for, of today, uh, from the energy transition to bio-based construction, from sustainability, uh, mobility to new cultural landscapes uh, and the city. And since February last year, we have also focused on the dignified recovery of Ukraine. Uh, I'm also a team member of UNUN, uh, an organization that initiated this uh, course. Uh, UNUN, uh, Ukraine, the Netherlands Urban Network, is a platform 
for Ukrainian and Dutch special professionals who have joined forces to gain and exchange knowledge and build capacity in the context of the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, we are just over a year old, but we have already managed to organize a number of lectures, courses, symposiums, and studio visits. Uh, we strive for a modern, sustainable, and flourishing Ukraine as a part of European Union. So we seek to cooperate with the best uh, practices and universities in the world, such as TUDELT. Uh, UNUN also uh, partners with other educational facilities, of course, Amsterdam and Rotterdam Academy of Unbaumkunst, uh, Independent School for the City, uh, Het New Institute, Air Rotterdam, INHS, and uh, many others. Uh, more detailed information can be found on our website, unun.nu, uh, or on our social media pages. Uh, so the course tools for post-war urban recovery, uh, Ukraine, will uh, examine lessons from previous approaches to reconstruction, such as uh, the Marshall Plan. We will discuss the uh, different role of diverse stakeholders and explore possibilities, possible spatial strategies for integrated urban recovery. Uh, during these seven lectures, uh, you will meet a number of practitioners, academics, researchers, and architects. And I want to express my gratitude to each of them. As a graduate of TUDELF, uh, some of the speakers I know personally. Uh, it is also my honor to thank the people without whom this course would not have happened. Uh, Dr. Roberto Rocco, uh, an Associate Professor of Spatial Planning and Strategy at the Department of Urbanism at Balkundi TU Delft. Uh, Dr. Caroline Newton, an Associate Professor and Van Ersten Fellow at the uh, Department of Urbanism at the Faculty of Architecture and Build Environment at TU Delft. And of course, uh, Dr. Julia Lawson, an adjunct professor at CUR, uh, and international urban and housing researcher at RMIT University, uh, lead author of the uh, UN report, Housing 2030 by uh, UNICEF, Inhabited and uh, Housing Europe, and co-author of the report, uh, Rebuilding a Place to Call Home, published recently by PBL. Uh, yeah, I'm now giving the floor to Roberto, uh, who will introduce our first speaker, Julie, and thank you all and good luck. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I wonder if my colleague Caroline, uh, I didn't tell you anything, but would you like to say something? Well, not, not necessarily, Robert, thank you, but uh, thank you um, all for being here. And uh, as Roberto said, um, thank you for involving us at U Delft. And uh, I'll give the, the floor back to you, Roberto, to introduce thank Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Well, today with us uh, are Dr. Julie Lawson. Uh, she's an adjunct professor at the Center of Urban Research at uh, RMIT uh, in Melbourne, who will speak to us about approaches for long-term housing recovery. Julie is lead author of the UN report, Housing to 2030 by UNIC, UN Habitat and Housing Europe, and co-author of the report, Rebuilding a Place to Call Home published uh, recently by PBL and which you have all received uh, with my last email. Julie was appointed honorary associate professor in 2013 and uh, her interests include international comparative research, urban development, land and housing policy and social housing finance. Julie is currently associate editor of the leading journal Housing Theory and Society and has been awarded two Ahuri grants in 2014 and 15 for international research focusing on the transformation of public housing. Uh, this lecture was developed uh, collaboratively with Halina Sukhomot, uh, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation, research associate at the Institute for European Urban Studies at Bauhaus University in Weimar, Germany, and member of the NGO New Housing Policy in Kyiv. Uh, Galina is also coordinator of the working group Crisis, Conflict and Recovery at the European Network of Housing Research. I know uh, in advance that there will be lots of questions about the assignments and the certificate and how the course works. Uh, but today we have a very, very uh, full agenda. We have very little time. So I will send you detailed instructions via email and via the website. All lectures are recorded and will be made available on our website, postconflictrecovery.org, where the course is also explained in detail. Julie and Halina, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for that good extensive introduction. Um, and soon, hopefully, we'll be hearing, uh, having an introduction from the, some of the participants as well in, a, in an efficient way uh, via um, the Mentimeter. Um, so if I just share my screen with, uh, with you to begin. So how's that looking? Let's get that show on the road. Radio. How's that looking? Okay. I'm not sure if it's helpful to have the captions or not, but I'm happy to have them there uh, if that's necessary. Um, if it becomes too crowded on the screen, perhaps Roberto uh, can uh, take them away because there's at times quite a lot will be written on the actual slides. So moving. We've now introduced ourselves, but we're also keen to hear um, from you to begin and ask you, um, if you can, uh, via the Mentimeter, uh, which country you are joining this presentation from, so we get an idea of who our audience is right now. Perhaps, uh, Roberto, you can help uh, facilitate that for us. Yes, I'll share my, I uh, have to share my screen now uh, so that people can see the Mentimeter. Uh, here it is. Sorry, guys. So if you go to menti.com uh, and enter the code 14810009, uh i'll give you one minute to to uh, see the code maybe you can also use the qr code otherwise uh we go to the next for from which country are you joining this session and i noticed already from the uh names of the people uh in the session that uh we uh have quite a a, a big majority of ukrainians uh i believe uh, but we have people from uh, actually all over the world. There are more than 200 people now in this session. Yes, as we as we uh, suspected, most most many people are from Ukraine. Lots from the Netherlands, where uh, Tildelt is located, of course. Germany, Poland. Oh, Myanmar is coming quite uh, uh, quite strongly. Belgium, where uh, Caroline is located. Uh, okay. Okay, we have 160 answers right now. So if you can't see the, uh, maybe you can see the, the the code, if you go to Mentimeter is 14810009, 14810009. And the, uh, the website is menti.com. All right, uh, Judy, I think people will continue to enter their, their uh, answers. If you want to, to continue, I will stop sharing now and we will uh, continue to record your answers. Yes, I, I think it's a good idea to move. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen now, is that correct? Yes. Now, just to begin, the main purpose and the contents of this uh, talk, which will be interspersed with opportunities for uh, some feedback, um, is firstly to critically understand different housing policy challenges affecting the right to adequate housing in a war or conflict situation with a focus 
in the end on Ukraine. Secondly, to be aware of relevant international approaches to housing related recovery, both their successes and also their shortcomings. And thirdly, to reflect and adapt relevant insights to Ukraine's context. Um, we wanted to start our presentation also by reflecting on the main concept which we are using in this um, course, so it's post-conflict reconstruction. As Roberto mentioned today, we also refer to post-war situation of Ukraine and recognize the um, Russian invasion and Russian war in Ukraine. And it's not just conflict, but uh, we just refer to immense body of international literature on post-conflict reconstruction and starting to define in what is it post-conflict reconstruction. So uh, generally the term post-conflict reconstruction concerns the rehabilitation and development of economic and social conditions. It has, it includes the different processes and actors, such processes as the relief assistance, the restoration of physical infrastructure and facilities, re-establishment of social services, and importantly, the creation of appropriate conditions for social well-being and economic activity, and implementation of essential structural reforms for macroeconomic stabilities and strategies for sustainable development. And this presentation today like, focuses on this last point about strategies, long-term strategies for housing, sustainable development, and um, Post-war and post-conflict reconstruction in, involves many, many actors, which you could think about, including affected communities, private sector, local and national governments, uh, emergency services, military, civil society, organizations, unions, universities, um, and of course, uh, different agencies, international agencies, uh, multilateral donors, international financial institutions, and so on. We're going to be focusing on housing. And by housing, we can see housing has a different role, or for example, as emergency shelter, uh, where survivors might stay for a short period, even perhaps even just overnight or with a friend or in some sort of public shelter, or in terms of temporary shelter, which might be for, a, say, a shorter stay, a few weeks after a disaster, it might be in a tent or some sort of public mass shelter, for example, a, a gym, or temporary housing where survivors can reside temporarily, perhaps for three months or six months or three years, returning to their normal daily activities and can take the form of a prefabricated house, for example. We are going to be focusing in this uh, uh, session on more permanent housing and a return to the rebuilt house or resettled in a new one to live permanently. Um, of course, post-war, post-conflict reconstruction should consider different types of housing and uh, temporary forms of housing and emergency housing. They are all very needed. Uh, but what's important not to forget the persistence of emergency housing and if you see an example um, of Germany that in 1951, still more than 10,000 people in Hamburg was continue, continuing living in temporary structures of so-called Nissen, Kuten, Nissen Hut, and it's just like one of numerous examples, including Ukraine, where people from 2014 been continuously living in temporary structures. Um, so therefore, uh, taking into account this um, critical evaluation of persistence of emergency solutions, we also focus in this presentation in um, more long-term solutions. So we're going to be focusing on the good, the bad, and the ugly, and ask ourselves, can we learn from past approaches and also past mistakes? And this involves also being alert to critical views. Criticism is good if it's constructive. 
But one of the many criticisms that's often made about reconstruction is its top-down and uniform approach that's taken by often international agencies. Also, a second criticism can be that it is a development as usual approach and fails to grasp the particular needs of war-torn uh, countries. Another, another criticism is that there is only my solution will work attitude or the sort of nirvana fallacy that if we do it my way, all will be okay. There's also criticisms which can be grouped according to colonialism or donor opportunism where particular types of reconstruction are enacted for, as a form of political gain. There are also critics which are um, made about the industry of reconstruction itself, the so-called relief and reconstruction complex, which can be the recipient of many, many resources while the local population receives less. Related to this, we also do see criticisms of NGOs as well, sometimes called ambulance chasers, who in crisis situation operate with little or no funding and try to capture some of the funds and resources from international agencies. And it's also well known that foreign professionals often receive salaries that are much higher than those of the local population, and that can cause conflict. And some foreign contractors might be unaccountable to the local population, even corrupt or wasteful of precious resources for the reconstruction of war affected countries. So it's very important that we take heed of these uh, criticisms in when designing. Um, uh, new approaches and uh, and learn from the past. In the recent past, we are also seeing that failures do continue. The UN University, for example, has made a case study illustration out of some of the issues relating to um, uh, failures of leaders in power or inconsistent aid or even profiteering um, in Haiti, which has been considered not particularly effective in terms of reconstruction. In particular, the creation of a parallel universe of um, reconstruction efforts, which failed to develop in-house capacity of the government and community affected. Uh, some more critical points related in particular to housing. Um, I'm sorry for noise, it's a big thunderstorm um, in my city. Um, so for being back to critical insights relating to housing, there is important, of course, critically evaluate self-help initiatives uh, when volunteering is amazing, but um, it has very uh, limited ability to uh, to respond to housing needs in long term. Um, also, there might be a danger of um, housing paradox that you would have at the same time oversupply of housing due to out migration and over demand of housing due to displacement, uh, which you could see in the case of Syria and Damascus. Uh, also, it's important to remember that um, coordinated, uh, lack of coordinated international help, that a lot of international help, help without proper coordination can lead to a fragmentation of efforts and very patchwork solutions. Um, uh, there is also danger of continual piloting, uh, meaning that a lot of agencies and NGOs are drawing a lot of resources to establish pilot projects. Uh, without continuation of this project or scaling up of this project or learning for them. And of course, there is big preference from international donors or aid organizations, often investors towards showcase projects or symbolic projects, which show uh, the symbolic rebuilding of the nation or of the city, but they don't actually respond to widespread needs of the people 
and there is danger that temporary housing solutions uh, will become long term and there would be an inertia to shift towards long term solutions. And uh, of course, reliance on private financing often favors prestige or even luxury development, uh, development outcomes, which often also ignores local context and local needs. And such projects and such uh, housing developments, um, they only exacerbate inequality, segregation, and in informalization. Uh, and more of this conflict between world-class projects without housing justice, you can also see in the Green Master Plan one that presented in the article by Houdani in 2020. Um, and just some of the examples of this commercial project, so symbolic project with Marota city in Damascus, Syria, which is being planned. Um, uh, for instance, the uh, redevelopment of the city center of Sarajevo, but the, when you would have a development which um, Budesco will call the imposition of form of spatial colonialism because it's so out of place or does not respond to local context very well. Just continuing on, um, also it's worth um, referring to um, the evaluations um, by Sifakis and Sardinesis um, on the reconstruction of Sarajevo, which they call the lost decade, where there was quite a mixed success with many stalled renovation projects. There was a lack of funds and some corruption. And Sarajevo today has many exceptional buildings with wonderful renovations as well. Um, also high-rise hotels and tourism has, has returned. Um, but there is much more that needs to be done. Some researchers have offered lessons from this, uh, these projects in the Balkans and in Athens as well. In the 10 lessons that are provided, uh, they talk about the clear recognition of what is the national interest instead of perhaps just glorifying a particular economic ideology or principles. Um, it's important to also um, be aware of nationalist narratives uh, while in mega projects, um, which may not actually meet the needs of, of the local community. Um, also, there are uh, need to be concerned about um, political clientelism um, and have strong anti-corruption mechanisms. It's important to have regulatory mechanisms which also precisely define what is in the public interest. When there are moves, for example, to decentralise power, it's important that this also be accompanied by organizational and financial capacity of municipalities at the local level. Otherwise, decentralization is merely the hollowing out of national responsibility without it, the capacity being enabled at the local level. It's important also that reconstruction encourages mutual trust in government in joint actions and involves transparent decision-making and procedures um, amongst representatives of the public, private and civil society. Boosting the autonomy of planners is important whilst creating original planning concepts and tailor-made proposals, also together with local communities, using innovative planning instruments that improve public dialogue and enable feedback between public sector planners and their citizens to create trust, mutual respect and cooperation. So I want you to join us now again, and I invite Robert to um, bring in the next question with Mentimeter and ask a question, what do you think are the biggest challenges in post-war, post-conflict urban recovery? Please let us know your thoughts.
so I think people can see uh, the uh, slide uh, in my screen. The uh, code is 14810009. And oh, uh, the answers are coming in, but they're not uh, showing up. Here they are. Corruption, capitalism, <laughs> I happen to agree. Affordability, corruption, financial aspects, avoiding mass privatization. Uh, Julie, do you want to read? How, how do you? I think this is really interesting. So many different aspects. I'm hoping by collecting this material also, we can share this uh, later on so we can uh, share these little insights from each other on the um, post-conflict recovery uh, website. Yes. Is that possible? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, I'll share the results with everyone. Uh, in order for us to save a little bit of time, uh, I will stop sharing. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll come back later. And, and we we'll come back later. Uh, the answers will be there. You can still, uh, uh, you can still uh, put your answer. In Anastasia, I see you have a, a question. Could you send it to me in written form, please? Roberto, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. So moving on, let's look at some potentially positive stories. Europe rebuilt, we know that, producing some of the world's most livable cities. It's interesting to take a look at how that was done. And in a way, this is also a contrastive way, a hopeful way of looking for suitable ideas and mechanisms that might be relevant to today. So the reconstruction of housing and also new affordable housing were at the forefront of recovery efforts following World War II. Technical assistance in this process was really central to building national expertise, and this was grown through also international assistance. In some countries, there was a very strong coordination of this international effort, for example, through the Marshall Funds, um, towards the development of affordable housing systems. In fact, 1% of the Marshall funding was used for technical assistance and 12% of the Marshall funds were used on average to build low cost housing. Imagine if that was the case of efforts today. So how was that done? In part through capital investment grants by the European Reconstruction Program and intergovernmental agreements on grant conditions on how long-term low interest loans could support a strategic and stable approach, building homes, as well as building social solidarity and social well-being. We're going to have a look at some of the better European practices which have been maintained and evolved and involved a multi-level governance approach, often involving non-profit models, ensuring a fairer and more responsive housing outcomes. And in these examples, you'll see that there's been a key role for not only an, the national own vision and cultural identity, but also key instruments in land policy, strategic planning, building municipal capacity, and ensuring adequate and affordable housing options for residents to return to. And in this, there's been a key role for cities and municipalities in housing promotion by land resettlement policy and strategic urban planning, dedicated housing promoters channeling grants and long-term loans towards new homes and empowered neighbourhoods. First off, we're going to look at Warsaw. The reconstruction of Warsaw ultimately became recognised as world heritage. Reconstruction began immediately after the uh, devastation and was undertaken initially voluntarily for the enormous return of Polish households seeking shelter 
and a place to make home again. However, this scavenging and self-building was very dangerous, chaotic at times, and also exploitative. Within months, the recovery and reconstruction efforts became well organized. With the help of the Reconstruction Office, the Warsaw Reconstruction Office, which is named as, known as the BOS. This was established to harness the expertise of many different professions, especially urban planners and architects. This greatly helped to rebuild the, not only the historic heart of Warsaw, but also neighbourhoods to quickly rehouse uh, the population which came back. You'll see some of the photographs in this uh, taken by myself, but also in the Museum of Reconstruction, which is in, now in Warsaw, which attracts many interested international visitors. One of the key instruments that was used early on was also not only the establishment of an agency, but also the land municipal municipalization of the affected areas. This was already an idea which was made popular in the 1920s and 30s through the Garden City Movement and was used and implemented in the Beirut Decree in 1945 to respond to the pressing need to house people. Decisions though taken at that time, of course they affected existing property rights and had these reclaims, reprivatizations have had continuing consequences for people in Poland, and it still generates urban conflict and tension today. As I mentioned, the War Warsaw Reconstruction Office was very, very significant. It in fact was the largest architectural and planning studio in the world at the time. And it, it employed directly one and a half thousand people with this strong professional capacity, even though there were limited technical resources, they were very well organized into 11 different departments. They drew on pre-war plans and ideas that existed at the time, and also archival resources, even paintings of streetscapes. They worked in very dangerous conditions. The land was mined, there was falling rubble, but they organized valuable materials. I mentioned, for example, rubble. Currently, there is an exhibition on at the Museum of Warsaw, which is all about the reuse of rubble and how important it was. Surprisingly, there are many, many parallels to ideas about circular economy and this exhibition, which can be drawn. As I mentioned, Warsaw attracts UNESCO World Heritage um, status, which is remarkable for the reconstruction of the old city which was important at the time for restoring the Poland Polish identity and nationhood. But there was also beyond the meticulous reconstruction of the facades, also attention to improving living conditions using modern standards, applying sunlight and nature, incorporating those into improving the living conditions of returning Polish households. Another example can be found in Finland. Way up north, the capital of Lapland is called Rovaniemi. Rovaniemi uh, was almost completely burnt to the ground while, when the Germans retreated. And it too had to be rebuilt to be a port city of the north. Wooden houses, schools and churches were all gone and there was only 10% of the city remaining. Rebuilding the city became a source of national pride. Here you can see the famous architect, Afro Alto, looking over his model building and his plan for the city, which is known as the Antler Plan, known for its reindeer-like antlers. Afro Alto was engaged in uh, leading a team which developed not only the housing, model housing, but also the city's plan and began with available materials rebuilding wooden households, then more durable brick homes for the maximum of four stories. 
There were row houses and apartment buildings divided into branches of parklands where safe, healthy and affordable housing were constructed in along garden city principles. This housing was designed for the climate and to maximize sun exposure. It's now home to more than 60,000 people. It's been built to last and remains a popular place to live today. The confidence to act was also inspired by the New Deal. Alto also created Lapland Plan, a regional plan for the area. This was made possible through strong municipal land policy and also with the combined role of the National Housing Agency or the National Housing Board, which was able to channel funds to municipalities. Municipalities drew up their annual housing programs and distributed loans and housing allowances to local housing builders and individual households, and later to housing companies of urban apartments. Municipalities also gained the right in 1949 to purchase ahead of needs, old farms, and so on. Municipalities in turn became major landowners through this right of expropriation and had good control over urban planning. They developed master plans and adapted these to needs. They used development agreements to ensure infrastructure was provided and ensure there was high quality architecture, often in park-like cities. Today, these institutions that were established in the late 1940s remain important in providing low cost financing via public investment um, by Unifin Bank today to address local needs and a broad range of housing types. What of international support? We've already mentioned the Marshall Plan, which is one of several uh, post-World War II reconstruction plans. There are also many others, but this is probably the most famous. Its purpose was to revive the working economy and, so, and also create the emergence of political and social conditions for free markets to exist and also for demand for US products via a mechanism of strategic par partnerships. It involved the injection of 13.3 billion in aid over four years from the United States budget to Western Europe uh, countries to increase their production, expand foreign trade, enhance internal financial stability and develop European economic cooperation. This funding was mainly via uh, grants and services, and I mentioned already, technical assistance. With regards to housing, it involved agreements with governments. These agreements uh, were made from a head office in Paris at the time. The, the ERF funding agreements were um, made by each individual recipient country according to their particular uh, housing system arrangements and institutional setup. That's why there was no cookie cutter approach to housing. And you see now if you like a smorgasbord or a chocolate box of different types of housing systems across Europe, which form, if you like, the, uh, the important um, uh, backbone of the, the affordable housing sectors today in the form of municipal housing, cooperative housing, non-profit housing, and so on. This was Rotterdam in 1944 which thankfully is now a thriving harbour city and gateway for West European trade. It also has a proud history of neighbourhood recovery and hosts some of the world's most exciting urban design. In the 1940s and 50s, advice to countries like the Netherlands was coming from the UN's Economic Commission for Europe. This was set up to provide technical assistance to many countries devastated by the war and implement the use of the Marshall funds. It has a similar role today. At the time in 1947 and reports in 1951, the UNECE was promoting the concept of non-profit housing 
often involving municipalities which would benefit from very long term and secure public finance. This approach to housing recovery was accelerated by the Marshall Plan in Austria, Germany, France, and the UK, and especially in the Netherlands. Through this very dedicated process, cities such as Rotterdam and Vienna were able to quickly provide homes for displaced residents. This effort overcame the backlog in poor housing conditions which had mounted during the Depression years. European Reconstruction Funds or Marshall Funds were allocated to countries via the Paris headquarters, as I mentioned, under agreements that reformed national housing systems. This involved very knowledgeable and extensive level of cooperation between the international agencies and the local governments, and the national governments receiving them. Indeed, there were 600 people working out of the Paris ERF office alone. That is far more than is currently working, of course, in the Ukraine office at the European Commission today. Through such a large scale effort, they were able to rehabilitate collapsed house economies and create much improved living conditions, building back better according to the advice of the UNEC at the time. So what can we learn from this? The scale of effort involved considerable public leadership and also purposeful investment, which reshaped markets of the time and improved and reinvigorated uh, housing markets and their outcomes. There were three important tools that were used to drive the housing recovery. Firstly, serious commitment to multi-level agreements for respecting the scale and purpose of investment required to address the massive housing need. Secondly, a strong commitment to public leadership in urban planning, in particular neighbourhood planning. And thirdly, the maximum use of mission-focused housing providers, such as municipal housing companies, non-profit housing developers, and cooperatives to build back better. The reconstruction the Netherlands received more Marshall funding than almost any other country, with around $109 per capita. The funds were used for building homes, for example, but also important capacity building as well, including the expansion of what was then known as the Delft Technical High School, or TU Delft. The plan provided funds for housing 9.5 million people rehabilitating agriculture as well, which was a priority to modernise the very outdated practices. The port of Rotterdam was also particularly important, and this was rebuilt and remains in the hands of the Rotterdam Port Authority today. Here's some pictures. The building you can see on the right is interesting. That was one of the first buildings that was rebuilt in Rotterdam to house all the small offices related to the port of Rotterdam, which had been completely destroyed. That also helped to keep the economic motor of the city running. The Netherlands today, social housing forms a very important part of its housing system, even more so in Rotterdam. Here on the right hand side, you can see a lot of Ukrainian people sitting on top of a building in Rotterdam, taking part in one of UN UN's discussions around recovery and what does it mean to build back better and what can we learn from other countries as well. Moving along to our other case studies. Vienna. Vienna is widely known and thought of as one of Europe's most livable cities. But during 1944, 20% of its housing stock was completely destroyed. Almost 87,000 homes were uninhabitable and 30,000 people had died. There was a lack of building materials, collapse of economic infrastructure, 
shortage of capital for reconstruction. Yet there was political commitment and international support from the European Reconstruction Programme. Well-defined funds were established, firstly for repair and secondly for resettlement. This was also coupled with a clear legal framework for using grants and long-term loans. And these, this investment was combined with purposeful land policy to accelerate rebuilding. To rebuild, there were mission-focused housing providers to deliver and manage homes. And they were dedicated to producing high quality housing outcomes that were affordable to everybody. Today, these homes enjoy wide residential satisfaction and social housing is something which is publicly accepted and not stigmatized. As I mentioned, there were conditional funds for repair, new supply, and later renovation. There's certainly something we can learn about from these dedicated circuits of investment, coupled with good rules to ensure that they maintained their, they delivered good quality homes of social value as well. For example, rents on repaired dwellings could not exceed the financing and operating costs once they were uh, renovated. Secondly, federal housing resettlement funds would only be used on an operating model that was cost recovery, limited profit. Thirdly, later on, funds that were um, uh, landlords that received housing rehabilitation funds could not increase rents rapidly so that that would lead to reno eviction or the eviction because of unaffordability. So all these ways of using circuits of investment also had very much an eye on what the impact would be on the households living there, on their living costs and on their long-term security. These are lessons that we had already learned in the late 1940s. And to some degree, we may have forgotten today so it's important that we look at history to remember um, how things can be done. I mentioned a legal framework for the use of funding. In Austria in particular, there is a legal framework which is based on cost rental. It also limits the profits to those which can be just simply made as a buffer fund for uh, risks. They also revolve surplus funds from rents towards future supply, major renovation. There are also cost caps on, for example, cost of management um, and also mission uh, of what these organisations do, that they invest in the activity of home reconstruction, maintenance and renovation, and that they don't do other businesses which might compromise that goal. And also they subject themselves to good regulation and auditing. They belong to a member of an auditing association, which they must belong to, which uh, ensures that they are compliant and using uh, their resources and capital efficiently and applying sound management practices. Stepping outside of uh, um, Europe for a little moment, which is also valuable to do, um, is to consider the lesser known uh, example, but important example of the reconstruction of Seoul in South Korea. It's very important because of the um, land uh, tenancy issues, um, and the issues around uh, democracy, um, also around choices of economic strategy. The program in Korea first focused on industrialization and only later on urban modernization. And that led to very, very poor living conditions for many, many decades um, in the 50s and 60s for the Korean people. There were only a few resources for housing, but this was later accelerated in the 1970s. During that time, 
new laws were introduced which enabled land acquisition and gave development powers to the city. And also there were key housing institutions which were established, such as the Korean National Housing Corporation to build uh, better housing conditions. This led to some very large scale housing pro projects which have transformed Seoul from a, uh, a city which had very poor quality housing conditions to a city of now 22 million with its own metro and uh, it's um, uh, significantly um, altered housing conditions. Here are some examples. So what did they use? The tools that they used in Seoul involved land readjustment, land value recapture, publicly led housing promotion, as I mentioned, the Korean Housing Corporation as well. And this involved uh, particular laws and planning instruments and agencies, um, strategic plans. But of course, these plans and tools have their problems and their issues. And nonetheless, in terms of um, the uh, the concerns around uh, tenant um, democracy, um, also the um, this sale and resale of some of the apartments um, caused a, a new sort of speculative um, spiral, stop-start spiral, which has also is also worthy of having a look into now that um, has evolved. We know, for example, now uh, that housing in South Korea is so expensive that it's having also implications for the society in terms of its, its continuation and its growth. Um, housing costs, in, they all are so high that um, you know, it's really giving few options for young people today. So there are definitely uh, some cautionary lessons and uh, worth considering there. In fact, I think only several weeks ago, there are now uh, subsidies to try to, um, to assist uh, uh, people to be able to leave home because they are only able to stay with their parental households and not able to make those steps forward. So let's uh, ask again ourselves, what tools are relevant for housing recovery? And are there anything that we can take from these examples that we've covered in the last few slides? Over to you, Roberto. All right, I will share my screen again. Uh, and uh, people are in fact already answering. Uh, what tools do you think are most relevant to address long-term housing needs? And here we see uh, the answers coming in. <laughs> uh, So what tools, uh, finance, urban planning and zoning, modular architecture, social and private housing. Well, I'm happy to see that planning has a, has a, a good position here, strategic planning. Participatory approaches are, I think are very important. Com community involvement, that's very good. Social housing, of course. Participation is coming up uh, very strong. All right, uh, I think we can uh, go back uh, to the lecture and please uh, continue to answer the questions. The code is uh, uh, 14810009, it's also in the chat. Um, okay, now we're going to switch and mm -hmm. focus on Ukraine. Can you see my screen, Roberto? Yes, we can. Okay, Halina is now going to take care of the next few slides. Um, yes, somehow I can reach the slides or oh, my screen. Um, yes, so we are going to focus now on the challenges of Ukraine's housing and Ukraine in general has, we can divide two types of problems these days. So. Of course, the biggest challenges are associated with the 
uh, resulted from Russian invasion. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there is an alarm in Kiev now. Uh, people need to go to shelters. I just wanted to say uh, to everyone that if you need to go to a shelter, please, your safety first. We will, of course, consider you, uh, you were present to this session. But your safety uh, first and good luck. Yes, um, uh, yes, talking about challenges with Ukraine housing, I'm sorry someone can experience them right now. And of course, our biggest challenges at the moment, uh, they are connected to Russian invasion. And this, so two types of them are there, like those connected with displacement. Uh, currently, there are more than 5 million of IDPs, inter internally displaced persons in Ukraine. And there are more than 8 million refugees outside of Ukraine, which also many of them in critical situation and waiting time to return to Ukraine and in need of housing. And there are problems of housing, of course, connected to destructions. And there are more than 1 million residential units are damaged or destroyed in Ukraine at the moment as they're uh, according to the World Bank report of March 2023, and over one third of the damaged units are destroyed, so almost 500,000 units are destroyed, meaning that they are not repairable and need to be rebuilt, according to the World Bank. And general losses to the housing sector in Ukraine are estimated to be more than $17 billion. Um, Please turn the slide somehow. Okay. Um, thank, uh, and there are other types of housing pro problems in Ukraine not resulted directly from Russian invasion in Ukraine, but still play a very important role in Ukrainian housing recovery to consider such problems are long-lasting challenges of Ukrainian housing, which are connected to its super home ownership system this balanced housing support policy that are focused primarily on home ownership, lack of comprehensive approach towards housing, that currently only a limited number of actively used policy instruments are available to deal with housing crisis and uh, resulted fragmentary housing and shelter solutions for the displaced present. Um, next slide. Uh, so just shortly to explain to the participants, so what does it mean, super home ownership housing system, super home ownership, so-called super home ownership housing regime is the term used by researchers such as Stevens um, to define the housing uh, system in uh, former socialist countries of Central Eastern Europe. Um, such housing system results from must give away privatization in 1990s, and particularly it is characterized by extremely high debt-free individual owner occupancy, um, meaning that most of the people who live somewhere, they own their housing without mortgage right away. Um, in Ukraine, um, before February 2022, it was around 90%, but data can vary in different sources. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, but the share of renting is rising nowadays due to displacement. And in such systems, there is um, the rental market is marginalized and dominated by small landlords. Um, and uh, for and people uh, in general, they have very high expectations towards the state in direct provision of housing, despite all marketization of the economy, because this uh, home ownership is secure, new, not through the market mechanism, but by direct giveaway privatization. And um, yeah, home ownership and giveaway privatization in general, it's absorbed socioeconomic shock during the transition, but many questions regarding maintenance, taxation, and land ownership remained unanswered and resulted in deterioration of housing stock. Um, and it just to show that the focus on home ownership is also led to this balance housing structure and this balance housing policy and housing support. So currently in Ukraine, 
uh, most of tools and mechanisms that are di directed towards the support of homeowners, such as reduced rate mortgages for buying first housing for young families or IDPs. Uh, such programs have not been very successful. For instance, only 41,000 households were supported buying the house since the beginning of existence of the state fund in 1994. There are still some um, mechanism of um, housing support, so-called apartment queue, which is the um, yeah, which came from some housing code in Soviet Union, but it was not existing, so it was not functioning so well in the last years. Also, there are present subsidies for electricity, heating bill separation for homeowners, and also there before the war and now there were small number of donors supported energy efficiency programs. On the other hand, while there are this numerous mechanisms of home ownership support, there are not too many mechanisms to support other forms of tenancy. And as a result, we have very underdeveloped social housing stock, despite the existence of the social housing law since 2006. For instance, Kiev, the city of 3 million people, had only 72 social apartments in 2019. Um, and other forms of uh, quasi-social housing or almost social housing, such as um, in our um, law, it's called temporary housing, uh, which was particularly developed for internally displaced people. It has not been sufficiently developed and it has been developed unevenly throughout the country with most of the stock being concentrated in the east of Ukraine, which is now uh, under the uh, most violent attacks by Russia. And um, also uh, we have under-regulated rental market uh, dominated by private vendors. So no, um, no rental support is available in Ukraine and no public landlords are existing. And cooperative housing forms in Ukraine are legally also not defined. And as a result of focus on home ownership, we have not enough instruments to deal with the current housing crisis. So basically, uh, all that 5 million people which are displaced or more than 5 million people who left their homes, they should rely on patchwork system of different solutions, which must be provided by international aid organizations, local NGO, volunteers municipalities and local level, they are mostly short term, for instance, people staying in gyms or mid term shelter approach when people living in containers. Some solutions present are very difficult to scale up, for instance, giving away housing for families for free, it's very difficult to scale up for, for the 5 million people in need of this housing. Um, there is also reliance on self-help in reconstruction, uh, many people don't wait help and they start rebuilding their homes, but also most of the IDPs, they are residing in unregulated private rental market, 60% um, of them. However, it cannot be also considered long-term solutions at the moment, as already in January of this year, 38% of IDPs households, they reported not having sufficient funds to, to pay their rent for housing throughout the winter. Um, yeah, and it just some, um, like as a summary, so in general, what we have currently in Ukraine is lack of comprehensive approach. I want to say that um, home ownership per se is not a bad thing, and many people profit from its stability of having a house. But what's the problem that lack of understanding where different groups of people with different needs should live when home ownership not accessible for many, which is the situation right now. And it's important to understand that securing home ownership is not the same as securing homes. And currently the lack of alternatives for households, lack of sustainability and diminished quality of living environment it just on the picture, recent picture where you can see left bank of left bank of Kiev turning into giant wall, and it's happening basically because in such system with lack of alternative, people 
are pressed to buy apartments, even though they are not of the best quality, because even renting is not considered very stable um, solution due to under regulation of rental market. And there is currently lack of policy instruments to deal with the housing crisis in case of emergency, which we can see right now. And in general, lack of understanding how housing policy interacts with, with other spheres of public governance, such as spatial planning and social policies. Mm, maybe uh, just very shortly, I will summarize that a lot of what's going on right now in Ukraine it's still based on this preference and continuity of home super home ownership housing regime uh, with very high expectations towards sustaining housing provision. So 80, 82% of respondents of the survey in October 2022 were still uh, thinking that the, the state should provide them with housing. A lot of focus on mortgages and compensation rather than the diversification of mechanism of housing support and tenure, and still like a lot of um, laws and prioritized real estate developers. But at the same time, even though the, a lot of uh, things continuing as they were before this full-scale invasion of starting the last year, there is some change in the system. We can see the change in demographic patterns, uh, we have an even growth and population decline, a lot of shifts and move, demographic movement um, in the country. Uh, we have increased importance of renting due to displacement. So I guess now as never, we have the highest share of renters in Ukraine toward general population. And we have the pressing need to solve the issue because of decline of incomes and growing and unaffordability of housing and many new actors entering the field. Um, so, and just very shortly, I would not repeat everything, but basically what should we remember that Ukraine post-war recovery in Ukraine in housing should respond not only to war induced housing crisis, but also systemic challenges in many ways. Can go further. So if uh, I can return to the conversation, Solana, Alina, about um, the role of Ukraine in leading its own recovery. Um, first and foremost, it should be hoped that it involves the Ukrainian people and drawing on their considerable determination and expertise. One would also hope that national and local governments are able to uh, respond to civil societies reasonable expectations of their role in shaping better housing systems for all and protecting, supporting and fulfilling their role, their right to adequate housing. So all levels of government are vital in this effort, but it's municipalities as the closest political institutions to the citizens and primary providers of public services, including housing, should be empowered in that capacity for participatory result-driven recovery um, to play an effective role in realising this, this right to adequate housing. So there are discussions which are rapidly taking place concerning Ukraine's recovery all around the world, especially in Ukraine, not just about funding it, but also about setting the kind of governance involved, the framework, its focus, and mode of implementation. There's also considerable focused attention to inform this effort from NGOs as well. We've heard already of Alina, who's part of New Housing Policy, which is an NGO, which is a team of housing and urban uh, researchers, geographers, uh, architects, sociologists, and so on, who are also part of a coalition of uh, urban professionals in Ukraine called Rosfit. We've also heard about research from SEDOS, which is a social policy think tank and NGO. There are other international organizations which are also trying to advise. UNECE is one of them that's been doing so for decades. We heard about their role since the Marshall days. They're still on the scene today and also advising Ukraine. And also there's some very interesting reports from the OECD that are coming out now, which has just established a base in Kiev. 
But who is responsible? Housing policy was a responsibility of the Ministry of Regional Development, Construction, Housing and Communal Services, and also State Inspectorate for Architecture and Urban Planning of Ukraine. But this has been reorganised. Now there is a munis Ministry of Infrastructure with four or five different deputy uh, ministers. Also key players include the Ministry of Finance. Municipalities, as we've mentioned, are vital for the implementation law affecting housing and urban conditions. They operate under national legislative and policy settings and also fiscal resourcing arrangements. University resources, researchers as well, have been making quite a lot of noise about recovery, as well as some aforementioned think tanks and civil society organisations in Ukraine, which also are trying to inform um, policy making. And what about international cooperation? Despite the ongoing conflict, the Ukrainian government has been very active in calling on its international partners to support it in its reconstruction. For example, uh, we also see funds being assembled. The World Bank has now the Multi Donor Trust Fund, which aims to channel grants for donors to Ukraine. The EU, by the EIB, has also set up a separate multi year facility to support the country, both in loans and grants format to enable Ukraine to be to also uh, access next generation EU facilities or invest EU recovery funds. Many different ideas have been suggested. There's also a group of EU member states, Germany, France, Poland, operating in close cooperation with Ukraine, also with the G7 group of nations. And you see recently, the Netherlands putting forward its own ideas together with new housing policy, SADOS, and RMIT and UNUN in the format of the PBL report, which was published last week. But are the international financial institutions really listening? Here we have a meeting of the EBRD in which Volodymyr Zelensky spoke about important laws that will help attract investors to the implementation of infrastructure projects. In particular, these are the laws on concession and large-scale privatisation. As we know, past privatisation of housing has been very expensive in Ukraine. Almost 94% of homes are in private hands now. But there is now a need for good choices to be made, including a well-regulated rental market and also involving effective non-commercial public and not-for-profit providers. And these are the very recommendations that have been made continuously by the UNECE since 2013, and also by local experts, SADOS and New Housing Policy, as well as the research from the PBL report. So the question will be, are IFIs really listening now? You can read more about in extra resources to this, this PowerPoint what some of the local experts and civil society groups are saying. I will just, yeah, I will just shortly overview, but as Julie already mentioned, uh, a lot of these recommendations from uh, civil society, they focus on the need to diversify the options for people and balance in housing uh, system and to focus not only on home ownership assistance, but improve rental conditions, establish non-profit providers, establish a new system of coherent public and social housing, but also answer the question of maintenance, building management in effective and socially responsible way, and the need to reform taxation of real estate to promote fair housing outcomes. As I mentioned, the UNEC has been advising Ukraine for many, many decades. And in 2013, provided a list of 18 re uh, recommendations, which include improving the legal settings around cooperatives and social housing, as well as coordination of land management and 
many other aspects relevant to recovery now. Those, many of those recommendations are still relevant today and we'll provide more details of those in the extra resources. There's also been some new thinking inspired by Housing 2030, which was an initiative of Housing Europe, UNECE and UN Habitat, which concerned land policy, good governance, circuits of purposeful investment and environmental standards. This report provides tools which are defined and illustrated in a report and a website and a series of 15 podcasts. Please have a look at the website, housing2030.org to find all those resources. Housing 2030 also had some involvement in the drafting of Ukraine's recovery plan. There was a working group on housing policy which involved around 40 Ukrainian uh, uh, participants, including five international participants. Those international participants were primarily the authors of Housing 2030. One of the important things is reviewing existing capacities and not continue on as business as usual. As we know, the rebuilding of damaged homes is one thing, there's also the, re the renewal of destroyed or completely damaged homes as well. So we've got repair and we've also got new homes um, and we've also got a rental sector which is unregulated or poorly regulated in which there are also absent um, players such as public interest providers. These are three areas, if you see some parallels, in fact, with the approach in Austria almost 70 years ago, where there was a need for specific funds for the restoration of destroyed property, for also specific funds for the creation of new, affordable, decent homes, and also regulations to protect tenants from rising rents or unaffordable housing situations. So Ukraine um, has drafted its own recovery plan and Alana is going to talk a bit about that. Um, yes, um, so basically all the, the most important points which we mentioned in our presentation, they were already included in last year's um, the recovery plan in Ukraine presented in Lugano. Uh, so we could see on the pages 148, 149 there, they mentioned the housing, social housing, and mentioned, for instance, the plan proposes to reform and consolidate a new concept of social housing, focusing on new supply of non-profit municipal and cooperative options to address widening needs. Also, the plan proposes to build municipal capacity to plan for and promote public non-profit and cooperative housing and the need to clarify and coordinate land policies to ensure sites that are available for needed social housing and revise and expand social housing programs and also to work to ensure energy efficiency and low carbon homes. So basically this all needed points are there already in the housing plan or recovery plan of Ukraine. And the uh, yeah, important points were presented also in the report uh, produced by PDL, Netherlands Environmental Energy, um, which we would give us more details as she was also one of the authors of this report. You can find this report on the PBL website in Ukrainian and also in English. There's also a, um, an audio and video attached to it, and there are um, a summary graphics uh, about it. Um, we sent the report to all participants uh, as that's well. That's great. I, th I think it's worthwhile moving along quickly because we've only got five minutes left. So um, what we'll do is just refer to the main recommendations, which are for a national framework or vision, um, the establishment of national governance, so an agency, as well as 
dedicated funding towards affordable housing solutions. We've also um, also about building uh, capacity for municipalities through um, not only the transfer of uh, appropriate funding, but also the professional um, urban capacities at the local level to undertake planning, um, project management, and also improve their capacity for housing stock management. What you can't see perhaps at the bottom there is the improvement of tenancy rights, which is something which has been mentioned over and over again about protecting not only in crisis times like now from exploitation, eviction and excessive rents, but also for the long term, providing secure, uh, affordable rental housing as an alternative to those who may not be able to or choose to uh, take on a mortgage for individual home ownership. We also outline our approaches to improve housing stock management, a variety of very interesting approaches which are in the report. Um, furthermore, the connection, the very vital connection to land use planning and all the different tools that can be used towards better integration of not only a variety of housing types and homes in a neighborhood setting, close to infrastructure, um, and economic and social opportunities and connection. And that's uh, outlined in the report tools for that in the context of the Ukrainian setting. This report was put together by, led by Alexander Anisimov from New Housing Policy with his colleagues, Pavlo Fedriv and uh, Sasha Chenkova, along with myself and Edwin Bartola. Um, so perhaps, Khalina, we can move to the conclusions. Yes, the returning to the beginning of our presentation, speaking about cooperation between different experts uh, and between different levels and international cooperation, um, it's important to uh, reflect uh, and recognize power mismatch between different actors in recovery, between international actors and local actors, but also between different levels of local actors and uh, civil society in general. It's also very important to critically assess international approaches as we could have seen international approaches in recent years have favored private sector led approaches, but this approach is largely failed or have not been successful in terms of providing uh, housing for different groups or so being context sensitive. Um, it is very important to include civil society or different international organizations also as a way to audit and oversee what's going on so the different voices in, included also different critical voices to ensure very like just um, just outcomes of recovery and they're needed to develop different accountability mechanisms for public transparency budgeting expenditure etc Lina, will you continue? Oh, okay. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, then, and there are also more um, conclusions, uh, more precisely in regards to Ukraine. Uh, so it's uh, necessary to respond to housing challenges uh, that's not only associated with destruction and displacement, but also systemic problems with housing politics and urban planning. However, there are many successful tools for housing recovery from post-war Europe there that were successful and led to creation of affordable and inclusive housing, which we could see also presented in PBL report for the reference. And such uh, this include land banking, municipal urban planning, purposeful financing and environmental standards, but what is also very important to keep these tools and application of these tools context, context sensitive and 
built on best practices, but also be critical to what what, what was going on in this um, historic example. And um, we could also see a very great recent article of um, Kushak und Adaus. I also sorry if I mispronounce it. Um, that providing a hopeful comparison of recovery, it can be inspiring inspiring way to think through necessary reconstruction reform. And one more time also that relevant tools have been put forward in the PBL report, uh, which you were sent uh, yesterday or today, and you could go through them more deeply and reflect on that. Um, so I would also like to thank you. Uh, you will be sent presentations. You could see key references also there to read more about it. Um, so we also very grateful to be here. And I would give also a word to Julie um, to conclude this presentation. Well, main thing is that thank you very much for, for, for listening, joining and um, for the opportunity to um, provide this session. Um, we'll be back at the, the last session, um, focusing more on land instruments. Um, so I hope to see as many of you then, um, together with Alexander Anisimov, who was a key author in the PBO report. So I look forward to um, continuing uh, with this interesting course together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie and Galina. I'll give the word to Pablo in a, in a few seconds, but I just want to remind everyone that the next session of this course will happen on Monday the 22nd uh, at 12 o'clock Amsterdam time. I, I sent around a website where you can see what time it is in your time zone. Um, and the reason it is at 12 o'clock is because our speaker is in Australia. So uh, she wouldn't be able to, to do it at this time. Um, it would be impossible for her. Uh, Paulo, I will give you the, the word so you can conclude our, our session of the day. Uh, just one thing, of course, we want to hear your questions. Uh, and I am, uh, I am recording the questions. We will do uh, our best to answer them. Uh, I'll convey your questions to Julie and to Galina. For today, it's not, uh, um, unfortunately, not possible to, to address all the questions. Paulo, the word is yours. Thank you, Nuno. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for joining. So today we were actually more than 290 attendants, which is a tremendous amount, I think. Um, just to say one thing, that during the lecture, there started a rocket alarm in Ukraine, and some people had to go, of course, into the shelter. Uh, just wanted to say once again, please don't worry about anything. It won't be uh, counted as an absence or anything, and you're safe at the first. So uh, that's important. That's what's important. Um, yeah, as uh, Roberto just mentioned, this, this lecture will be also available on the uh, website of the course, as well as uh, on the YouTube channel of Global Urban Lab, if I'm correct. Uh, yes, with the name of the, of the course as well. And uh, yes, yeah, so the next lecture next Monday, it will actually be happening every Monday. Uh, next Monday, uh, European time, uh, East, yeah, uh, Central European time, it's uh, midday and uh, uh, Eastern European summer time is going to be 1 p.m. So also not to get the confusion, also for uh, different other countries, please check what the time is there. Um, yeah, so the next um, uh, speaker, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Mithul Vahanvati. Uh, as Roberta just mentioned, she will be speaking from Australia. That's why the, the time difference is uh, so big. Um, yeah, the topic of the next session will be community-led self-recovery approach to housing. So I think uh, another interesting topic. Uh, once again, just want to say a big thanks to our today's speaker, Julia Lawson and uh, uh, Galina Sukhamut. Uh, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Roberto Rocco and Caroline Newton, thank you very much for hosting all of us. And thank you all for joining. Uh, there was a lot of people. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you all next Monday and please stay safe.
stay stay safe everyone thanks for being here it was amazing attendance today thanks everyone bye julie bye galina thanks. see you bye 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 thanks thanks roberta terrific really really good thank you so much thank you thank